Hello, my name is Dorothy Ogden and I'm the Emerging Technologies Librarian at the University of Alabama at Birmingham. This is a recording of a presentation originally given on June 30th, 2020. The title of this presentation is Introduction to Adapting 3D Digital Models for Remote Instruction. And the presentation was originally given to members of the Department of Earth and Planetary Sciences at the University of Tennessee, Knoxville. The original idea for this presentation came out of a collaboration between myself and Dr. Stephanie Drumheller Horton of the Department of Earth and Planetary Sciences at the University of Tennessee, Knoxville. Dr. Drumheller Horton does receive some support from the National Science Foundation. Three objectives for this recording. One is to help you understand basic attributes of 3D digital model files. One is to help you become familiar with the process for uploading those models to Sketchfab and working with those models in Sketchfab. And the third is learning about the process for embedding Sketchfab models in learning management systems. Our example today will be Canvas because that's the learning management system we use at the University of Alabama at Birmingham or UAB. However, you should also be able to use this information to embed models in any LMS that provides an HTML editor for content. We're going to start by comparing two-dimensional digital images and 3D digital models. Two-dimensional images should be very familiar. Those can be anything from pictures you might find in a Google image search, to images or photographs you take with your phone and upload or share, even memes you might find on social media. And if you've ever worked with any of these files, you probably know there are different types of files. So even though you have something and it's a picture, it could be saved as a JPEG file, a TIFF file, a PNG file, or different formats. And if you've done any graphics work, you might know that there are best file formats for certain uses. Um, so we'll commonly see JPEGs used for web display, but we might see TIFF files used in other settings. Starting off, we're going to compare two-dimensional digital images with 3D digital models. And most of us are pretty familiar with two-dimensional digital images. That can be anything from a picture you took with a mobile phone, an image you found in a Google image search, a meme or something you've seen on social media. If you've ever worked with 2D digital images, uh, you probably know that there are different file types. So even though everything is a picture, your file might actually be saved as something called a JPEG. It might be saved in the TIFF format or a PNG format. And if you've worked a lot with these types of files, you probably know that there are best uses for certain file types. We'll normally see JPEG files used in websites or for web display, whereas we might see TIFF files used more for printing. And just as there are certain file types that have best uses for different applications in 2D digital images, you'll also see that there are best uses for certain file types in 3D digital models. The different types of files for 3D digital models can include the FBX file type, the GLTF or GLB file type, and then if you're familiar with 3D printing, you may have worked with the OBJ or the STL file type. And just as in 2D digital models, different types of files are best for different kinds of uses, you'll find there are different types of 3D digital model formats that are best for different types of uses, whether that's 3D printing or virtual reality or web display. Two-dimensional digital images are composed of a piece of information called a pixel. Um, and the data associated with the pixel influences things like the resolution of the image or the way the image can be displayed. And if you've ever tried to work with an image by clicking and dragging the sides to make it bigger, but the picture got blurry or when it printed out it was blurry, that's a characteristic of it that's influenced by the resolution. And that's why the information on pixels is important. 3D digital models are composed of units called voxels and that influences the appearance and properties of the model, particularly the size and complexity of the model. And that's very important to know about because since our models are three-dimensional, the more complex a model, the more information in a model, which is going to make it take more computing power to manipulate. Two-dimensional digital images store color information. So a two-dimensional digital image might be a black and white picture, might be a picture in grayscale, which means it's all gray tones. It might be a color image. Similarly, 3D digital models can be used to store information about the surface colors of the model. And this is a place to be careful when you're picking out file formats because not all 3D digital models store surface color information. 
Sometimes surface color information, you might hear that referred to as a texture or texturing on a model. And that has to do with display different colors or color variation or patterns on the surface. When you're working with two-dimensional digital images, large files are generally either megabytes or gigabytes in size. For 3D digital models, size can vary greatly depending on the complexity of the model. So you could have a model that's made up of maybe six faces or six polygons. That's going to be very low in size. You could have a model that's made up of hundreds of thousands of voxels or polygons, which is going to be very complex. And the tricky thing is the appearance of the model is not necessarily going to give you a clue about how many polygons or surfaces are in the model. That may be something you have to dig into the data to find out more about. Last characteristic to note, 2D digital images have height and width. So we're used to those being squares or rectangles, and they have an X and Y dimension. 3D digital models have X, Y, and Z dimensions. So they have height, width, and depth. And that Z dimension is what gives them depth and what's enables, what enables us to manipulate them or turn them around. And then last characteristic, and this is something unique to 3D digital models, 3D digital models are sometimes displayed with a light source. So lighting can change the appearance or the lighting settings for a given application can change the appearance of the model. So you might open a model in one application where there's no information on how to light that model and it will look very plain and then open the same model in another application without making any changes that has some light settings that will make it display a little bit differently so it might have some shadows or parts of it might look washed out and that's because there's another setting to look at with that model. There are a couple different techniques for making 3D digital models. If you're making models of things that have existed in the physical world, at some point more than likely you've been using a technique called photogrammetry. A very brief introduction to this, photogrammetry is basically the science of measuring physical objects using data from pictures. This is just an example to show you how that works. If you've ever used a laser scanner or a handheld scanner or even a mobile device to take multiple pictures of an object and then put those together and then put those together using a stitching or an editing program in a computer, you've been doing photogrammetry. In the example on the slide, that technique was used to take multiple pictures of a statue and then recreate a model. You can also use it to recreate spaces digitally. This is a three-dimensional digital model of the Widener Library at Harvard. I'm accessing this in a web browser, so I didn't need any special software. And you'll see I'm able to move the view around, but I'm also able to move through this space in a three-dimensional way. And they also have some annotations in the space that show you different pieces of information about the library. This is a comparison of a two-dimensional digital image and a 3D digital model. I am in the edit mode for PowerPoint right now. And you'll see I've got a screenshot on the left of that model. And I can manipulate it in two dimensions, but I can't really manipulate the model. On the right hand side, if I click that model, I can drag it and move it around. So I can look at that in different views. And this is a model file I downloaded from the NIH 3D Print Exchange in the WRL format and then converted to a GLB file format. Other than doing that conversion, I didn't have to do anything extra to put this in PowerPoint. And you'll notice as I turn that model around, the lighting changes, so these surfaces are reflective. So if I move that model, the light will reflect in different ways. And the model will have a slightly different appearance depending on the angle. This is a comparison of 3D digital models, one with surface textures and one without. On the left is an OBJ file. These are different copies of the same item in different file formats. And you'll see I can click that object and drag it and the view will change. 
there are some shadows that come and go depending on the angle of the object, but there's not any surface coloration. On the right, there's a GLTF file, and you'll see there's color variations in the surface of the model. There are even some markings right here from when the model was digitized. I believe that's a collections label. And you'll also notice that the appearance of the object is changing a little depending on where the angle of the object because of the light source. These are the recommended file formats for use on Sketchfab. They're not the only formats that Sketchfab supports. We are going to focus on Sketchfab in today's presentation because it provides access to an embeddable web player. And just like you would embed a YouTube video in a learning management system or a website, you can also embed the player with these 3D digital objects. And our purpose in examining that today uh, is to provide information that might be useful for teaching in the time of COVID-19, specifically for the fall if you have classes that normally utilized objects or utilized models that are going to be very difficult to translate into a distance learning context. Hopefully this will provide some good options for that. I mentioned earlier that if you have a very, very complex 3D digital model, it could be difficult to work with. There is some information from Sketchfab about working with very complex models. If you have a complex model and you upload it, you could potentially see some performance issues, so it might be hard to manipulate the model, or it might take a long time to load. If you do need to change your model or your model is very complex, you can address that uh, by lowering the polygon count. Some tools that will allow you to do that with some beginner level processes are MeshMixer and MeshLab. Those are both free applications. If you do need more complex tools for model editing and you still need a free application, you might check out Blender. Adobe Dimension is a newer tool that is available as part of the Adobe Creative Cloud. That is fee-based, but it is a tool for working with three-dimensional digital models, and you can actually use that to set up three-dimensional scenes as well. There's an application available through the Creative Cloud called Adobe Arrow, which you can use with Adobe Dimension to actually publish things in an augmented reality environment. We're not going to focus too much on augmented reality today, but it, that's a new term for you. What that means is setting an ob 3D digital object up to work with a mobile device's camera. And what that will do is when you open up that object or you get a link to that object, it'll activate your device's camera. So you can aim your device at a countertop or a table and then anchor the model in that space. So it will look like the model is in the space and you can walk around while looking at your phone and look at different angles of the model, you might be able to interact with it or add animations. There's some really exciting stuff coming in this area, but it is still very new. Currently, Adobe Aero is only available for Apple devices, but I'm hoping that will be updated soon so it's more widely available. And again, Dimension is their fee-based tool that kind of pairs with that for using 3D digital models, not for making those models, but just displaying them. These are some questions to consider. If you are not able to create models, but you are looking for some to include in your teaching, um, just like we would with any textual document, a video, a photograph, you want to be extremely critical of your model sources. I mentioned that I'm a librarian by training. Within libraries, there is an area called information literacy. That's focused on providing information for library patrons and teaching around how to ask good questions about sources of information. So if any of these questions are interesting to you or you'd like to find out more about that, I'd encourage you to reach out to a librarian. Questions to ask as you begin to evaluate models. First thing, what data is available about this model? We might also call this metadata and how it was created. So can you tell who created a model? Is information available on the technology or technique used to create that model, whether that's the type of camera, the type of software, the person at an institution who might have actually done the work on the model? Is there information available on either what institution or the person who created the model who currently has possession of the physical object that the model recreates? So especially think about that for things that are in museum collections. 
or our pieces of art. And along with that question, what copyrights may apply to the model? Is there information available for that model on a Creative Commons license? If you find something that you're really interested in, but it's listed for sale or it's on a commercial site, uh, be sure to perform some due diligence on whether or not it's ethical and legal for that model to be for sale. Make sure the model was created using best practices for the type of information represented. I mentioned metadata in the previous slide, and this is just a general overview, especially if you're going to be creating and uploading models yourself. Metadata just literally means data about data. So it's information that describes an object, helps explain what it is, or makes it easier to find. For our purposes, if you are going to upload unique items to Sketchfab, you want to make sure to have very good descriptive information so that model is findable. Types of metadata um, include descriptive, structural, and administrative. In terms of creating models and then making them viewable using the Sketchfab online player, descriptive, and administrative and metadata are what are going to be important for you. This is again a specialty area within libraries, so if you have questions about this or like information on how to do this well, I'd encourage you to reach out to librarians and informationists you may know. And if you are working with an informationist or a librarian, this is some information for them. Uh, this was provided by one of the metadata librarians at my institution, and it's some information from something called the RDA Toolkit. Um, that tells how to describe three-dimensional forms of information. And between the time I originally gave this presentation and I made this recording, a new paper was published in this area. And this paper addresses ongoing work in libraries and museums to discuss how you might store and make findable information on 3D digital models and virtual reality. I'm really excited to read this. And again, if you're working with a librarian or an informationist or you'd like to bring them some information, this is a great resource for them. I mentioned copyright in the Creative Commons. We won't spend a lot of time on that today, but just know that 3D digital objects are subject to copyright, just like two-dimensional works, whether that's a photo, a movie, a textual document. If you're making things and sharing them, you might want to consider looking at the Creative Commons licensing. Keep in mind, I am not a copyright attorney and I don't specialize in this within libraries. If you do have questions or concerns, Again, please reach out to your librarians. If you're not a currently affiliated with an institution that has a research library, I'd encourage you to reach out to your libraries locally or at the state level. They'll be happy to help you find resources on these topics. Um, you may also reach out to scholarly communication specialists who have some information on this area as well. Switching gears now, we're going to talk about Sketchfab. So that is a website that does have a commercial component. It's somewhat analogous to YouTube for 3D models. Keep in mind, anybody can put content on this website, which is why you'll see variation in models. You will find different cultural heritage institutions, academic research groups putting information here. You'll also find um, independent content creators sharing art. And because anybody can submit content just like YouTube, you do want to be asking those very critical questions about what you find, who made it, whether or not it's reasonable and ethical for that to be on the website. And this is just one example from a Sketchfab page. Um, you can see there is a werewolf skull posted here. Um, and it's next to a model of the Guggenheim in New York. Just to illustrate, there are models of things that have been physically present in the world, um, but there are also pieces of incredible digital art here that are very interesting but are not objects that actually were extant. So keep in mind when you're pulling objects out, you do need to be looking and asking those very critical questions about what the content represents and if that's an accurate representation, if that's what you need for your teaching purposes. This is the Sketchfab page for the British Museum, and you can see they have a variety of models of objects in their collections. Just to get started looking at a model, we're going to look at this model of a falcon. And that model has loaded in the Sketchfab player. Again, this is just like watching a YouTube video, except I'm able to manipulate that object. I can zoom in or zoom out. I get a pretty good surface detail there. I 
For those of you interested in virtual reality, there is a VR viewer here, and I think that is still in development from Sketchfab. I tried it the other day in the Oculus Quest. Uh, it was very impressive, so a very exciting thing there. And I did just pull this website up and then go into 3D mode from the website in the browser built into the Oculus. I didn't need special tools other than that web browser. And if we look at the metadata for this object, you'll see Here's the object title. You can see the institution that's associated with. You have some information on who did the scanning, the camera they used to do the scanning, and some software that they used. The publication date was six years ago. If I hover, you can get the actual date. There's some information on the model. And if I come up to the top, you'll also see I can click and get an embed code, and we'll work with that a little bit more later, but just to show you what that looks like. And then there's also a sharing link, so I can either copy a link to this model page or I can share on one of these platforms or again use that embedded player. These are examples uploaded by a colleague of mine at the University of Alabama at Birmingham. His name is Scott Brandy and he teaches geology. What he's done here is digitized a variety of those samples and then made them available through Sketchfab. So I'm going to click this one. And Dr. Brandy does go by RockDoc on a lot of social media. So you see I've clicked that model. I can look at different angles. I can zoom in. And you can also see Dr. Brandy's added a variety of annotations, which is what this number is. So if I click that, I get an annotation about the feature, and I'll show you the tool for that in just a moment. One of the really interesting things Dr. Brandy's done is he's linked a lot of different media he has online for learning to the annotations. You can see if I click this one, I get a picture where he's put a ruler in the picture, um, and you see some scale. You can also see in this annotation, he's actually got a video of a test. And here's a video of that test. So he's pulled in a tremendous amount of learning resources linked through this 3D model. Now that we've looked at a couple of examples, we're going to talk about the workflow for using some of those models in Sketchfab. And this is assuming that you are creating models on your own. If you're not able to create your models or you're not ready to do that yet, you can skip right to the end of this workflow where you use the sharing links to embed a player in Canvas or in your learning management system. If you are making models, um, you will want to make work through this workflow. First thing, create that model. When you do that, either through scanning or through another means, make sure you keep the original files for that model. One of the things you'll want to brainstorm in this step is your intended use. So if you're doing something and you need a model to have color data in the surface or you need it to have certain color characteristics for the activity you have in mind, you'll want to make sure you select the riot file format for that use because remember not all 3D digital models save information about the surface color or the surface texturing. Once you've got that model, consider consulting a librarian or another specialist in copyright, whether that's somebody who works in scholarly communications or counsel for your institution. Get the copy of the file type that you need for your intended use. Load that model file into an application for sharing. Again, in today's demonstration, we're going to use Sketchfab, but Sketchfab is not the only platform for sharing models this way. It's also not the only way to display 3D digital models on the web. Once you've loaded that model, make sure to carry it your metadata. So you want to make sure you have a very descriptive title. You add information about your institutional affiliations or the affiliations for the object that the model reproduces. You also want to put information in there about how you created that model, where the original object might be stored, contact information for your lab, just as if you were writing a textual document or another piece of scientific communication. And then last step, either use links to share that information out or embed that file in Canvas or your LMS or the environment you'll be using for digital learning. We're gonna switch gears a little bit now and look at the tools in Sketchfab for working with these objects. This is my account in Sketchfab. It is a free account, so I've only got one demonstration model. And this model is a 3D version of a bookmark that I actually use for 3D printing. So this is something that I remixed 
uh, from a file on Thingiverse. I did the remix in Tinkercad, and I 3D print this bookmark as a promotional item for the libraries and for our 3D printers. So this is something that I take to instructional affairs for faculty, or if people want to see a demonstration of the 3D printer, I'll usually print this bookmark. And if we scroll down, you can see I've titled it Promotional Bookmark for the UAB Libraries. There's my name as the creator, and I've got a summary of how I made this file. So this is something I exported in the, G in the GLB format out of Tinkercad, which is where I remixed the model. And I've also got a link to the original item that I remixed. You can see the information I've added here. So I classified this as a gadget, and I tagged it with library, 3D printing, Tinkercad, and bookmark. And just a note for the audience, I will eventually delete this bookmark, so if you're watching this a couple months after we've published the presentation, you might not be able to find it on Sketchfab. If you're curious about this project, please do reach out to me. I'd be happy to talk to you about it. So now that you've seen how that model is displayed to the user, we'll look at how to set that up. So this is the properties page for the model. If you look on the right side, you can see the status. It is published, and because this is a free account, I can only make this model public. If this was a paid account, you might you can make this model private. You could also make this model only accessible with a password. And you'll see there is a link to download the models. I'm going to pick no for this, but you can use this platform to make downloadable versions of your model. So if you've got a model and it's available in one of that GLB format and maybe an OBJ or an STL, and you want people to be able to get a copy of that model that they might be able to 3D print or edit themselves, you can do that here. I would leave that turned off by default unless you had consulted someone at your institution about models, especially if you're making models of things that are in your university or your museum collections. If you do enable free downloading, you'll see there is an option to add a Creative Commons license, and you even have some choices here in the type of license that you can apply, and that will appear in the interface if you select that. But again, I'm going to say no to that. You can see there are spaces here to edit the title. I can add additional categories. So there is a cultural heritage and history category. There's also a science and technology category. Um, you'll see you also get some automatic suggestions for tags that you can select as well, again, to add to that descriptive metadata for the model. Once you've added that information, do you make sure to click Save. There's an additional tool set if you click Edit 3D Settings. And this tool set is what you'll use to edit or change the appearance of the model within the web player. You'll see across the top, there's a general setting for the scene. There are lighting settings, material settings, post-processing filters, tools for annotation, tools for animation, tools for virtual and augmented reality, and also a sound tool. Today, we're just going to look at the general lighting and annotation settings. And in general, you'll see you can do some basic things, uh, such as change the background. So I can change my background image, and these are things that are built into Sketchfab. This isn't, this isn't material that I uploaded. You can also put it a specific color behind an object, and you can see how that might change the appearance of your model. One nice thing about using Sketchfab to manage these models is as you make changes here, anywhere that model is linked or the player is embedded, it will automatically change as well. So we'll go back to that dirty light background. And the next thing we'll do is look at lighting. Just to show you how lighting can affect the way your object is displayed. So you'll see I can adjust the brightness of the lighting. I can adjust the type of lighting. I can adjust the orientation of a light. And you'll see as I pick different settings, and again, these are presets in Sketchfab. I didn't add these. The appearance of the model changes as well. The last thing we'll look at today are the annotations. And you see I've got four here right now. You can see my four annotations are listed on the side. I can also click them on the model. Sketchfab supports the use of something called Markdown. If you want to add a hyperlink or bold text or manipulate the appearance of the text in other ways, you can use Markdown. You can see here I have a description 
of my bookmark and then I also have a link out to my 3D printing library guide. And you can link to all kinds of different information. So you can do websites just like Dr. Brandy did or other media. You'll also see in the second annotation I have, I've got a link to our library's discovery system and a link into a book that I frequently recommend on 3D printing. So if you're in an academic setting and you'd like students or other users to link into a catalog or link into an article, you can add that as well. And then the last, and the last example I have for you is I have a picture of the 3D printer that I usually use to print this bookmark embedded as well. You aren't able to drag and drop pictures into these annotations. You do have that have to have that image hosted somewhere. And so you can see I had to paste the URL for that image into this annotation. I can't store the image itself in the annotation. To add an annotation to the model, all you have to do is double click where you'd like to put it and, and then enter some text. And I'm able to view that from a variety of angles and test it out now as well in the player. Once you're finished ch making changes to your model and annotations, if you save your settings and then click exit, you'll go back to the page we were previously on for your model. And you can then go view your model in the player again. And you can see where I've added the new annotation, I've got the newer annotation, and then I've got the old ones as well. And I can test the links. The last part of our presentation, I'm going to show you how to embed that player with the 3D object into Canvas. This is a test environment that I have in Canvas. I've been adding these as pages. So I'll add a new page. And then I will go back to Sketchfab click the embed, and then click to copy the embed information, then go back to Canvas, then find the raw HTML editor, paste the embed code, save, and you'll see there's my model in Canvas. And then I can save that page. and I'm able to manipulate that model. You can see it automatically pulls in from Sketchfab the title by name as the creator. And then I can link back to the Sketchfab page there. And the annotations work here as well. So I can click that link and it will take me out to the discovery system for my institution. So I could link into that ebook to look at content about 3D printing. There's a picture of the printer that I used to 3D print this bookmark and some additional information. These are a few other demonstrations I've set up just to show you the variety of models on Sketchfab and how they function in Canvas. So this is a model of the Tetralogy of Fallot. This was published by the Children's Hospital Colorado Medical Media. And you can see I'm able to manipulate this model I can look at different views. I can see some annotations they've added to model different features. And I can link out to their this model specifically, their account on Sketchfab or the Sketchfab website. I've also got an example from the Smithsonian's 3T digitization project and they've been doing some really exciting things with objects from their collections. They do use a different player, so this is not something that's available through Sketchfab. They use a player that they're currently developing in-house called Voyager, so there are a few different tools available for this. The one I particularly like is for measuring. So you'll see I can click this tool, something pops up in the bottom, I can click a measuring tool and turn on a tape tool and I'm able to manipulate that object so I can read the back of the tin. And then I can also use that measure tape tool to select different points on the model and accurately measure distances. So I've measured the side there, I could record that. And I can, end, there's a lot of really cool tools built into this web player for 3D digital objects that provide a lot of really robust ways to explore what's there. 
The current Sketchfab player that I showed you today does not have that measuring tool, but they do have something in the Sketchfab Labs experiments area that provides a similar functionality. The only catch is they don't have units for their measurements. So you can see I've got the tool pulled up here and there's a note that says the distances are unitless. So again, this is something they're still developing. It's not available in the standard player. I do have a link to it at the end of this presentation if it would be useful. What you have to do for this is load model separately. So you would click this load 3D model button. It opens up this window and you can search for 3D and VR models in Sketchfab or you can look them up by URL. I'm gonna look my bookmark up by URL. And so you can see this has loaded my bookmark and I'm able to click different pieces of the model to get a measurement. So it'll give me a distance, but it doesn't have a unit associated with. So I can see this being very interesting if you knew the dimensions of a model already and you wanted to simulate measuring using the Sketchfab player, or you wanted to try to measure things that were already available in Sketchfab as models. Um, but just keep in mind, there might be some adjustments needed if you're gonna develop this as an exercise for distance learning. So to wrap up our presentation today, we covered 3D digital models. That is a form of digital work that's increasingly available in both browser-based environments and in virtual reality and augmented reality. We didn't talk a lot about virtual reality today, but it's a format I think we're gonna see continue to become available in educational spaces, especially as we try, especially as we investigate new ways to learn in a distanced manner. Virtual and augmented reality, just a quick reminder, virtual reality uses either a virtual cave, which is a room that immerses you, or a headset that you wear independently that completely immerses you in a visual digital environment. Augmented reality is typically done with your phones. So that might be something like Pokemon Go or Lego Hidden Side, where the application utilizes the phone on your mobile device to show the environment around you and then put a digital model in that environment as it's displayed on your device. I think these types of models have a lot of potential interesting uses in distributed and digital learning environments. I do think it's very important not to aim to totally replace things we might do in a physical learning environment with these models. I think they can be a really great supplement. Um, and I've heard of people using them to do lab orientations or introductions to equipment so that when you have time with the actual equipment in person, you have a much lower learning curve. So you can do a lot of training ahead of time and then utilize your hands-on time and your in-person time much more effectively. So again, think of this as a supplement, not a replacement, but it's also a really great and exciting new way to learn. We looked at Sketchfab today as the platform for displaying 3D digital models. Again, that's not the only platform for doing this. I selected Sketchfab for this talk in part because I've been looking for 3D digital models in our library's discovery system and in looking through research data sets and things that were available in different repositories. I realized that a lot of institutions were linking that content through Sketchfab in addition to making the raw research data available. So I decided to focus on this platform. It also has that embedded web viewer that's very easy to use to embed objects in a web browser so that people with internet access can use them without any additional equipment or training. And then finally, we mentioned briefly a couple times copyright metadata and finding models. Again, if you have questions about copyright or you're concerned that you want to provide high quality and robust metadata for your models to make them more accessible and more findable, please consult your librarian or an informationist or a scholarly communications professional at your institution. Librarians really love to help with this. We've been doing this work for a long time and we're really excited to try to help develop for this new medium. A brief note, I am a fellow of the Visualizing the Future Symposia that is an ILMLS funded grant looking to create a community of practice for data visualization in, in libraries. I do think of 3D digital models as a form of data visualization, something I'm interested in investigating from that perspective. If anybody's interested in the work of the symposia, please feel free to reach out or visit that website. These are some resources for Sketchfab to get them, help everybody get started in uploading models and using models. So the link to the preferred file formats is here. 
some information on texturing, which we talked about is affecting the surface appearance and the color of a model. If you've got very complex models and they're difficult to use in the viewer, there's some information on how to troubleshoot that. And then also using markdown and images in the annotations. These are some resources from around the web where you can also find 3D digital models. The Smithsonian 3D Digitization Project is a fairly new project. It's very, I think it's very exciting because they're digitizing things from their collections and making them available in the web-based player. Uh, you saw that with the tin that I showed you is the last object, and you can see they have a lot of really interesting tools for interacting with those models in a web browser built into the player. And I think that player is being developed open source. They may have additional information about that forthcoming. You can also check the open science framework. So again, a lot of the models I was finding when I started to look into this were through different research data sets that had been deposited in open data repositories and then had been uploaded to Sketchfab or were on display in Sketchfab. So you can find these in some surprising places, whether that's open science framework, the Digital Egypt project in Sketchfab, Sketchup, which is a platform that's a little bit similar to Sketchfab, but I know I think it's used more for architecture. I spend a lot of time on the NIH 3D Print Exchange um, looking at models and thinking about how we might be able to use them as some of those models in different formats, particularly virtual and augmented reality. And I think they've recently launched a project that does use augmented reality on a mobile device in conjunction with models available that you could also download in 3D print. So I'm very excited about how the 3D digital model ecosystem is evolving in terms of make, enabling us to distribute information objects, whether that's a digital model that you can use both through 3D printing and in a virtual format, and then maybe in your web browser or in augmented reality. So you have many more options that are evolving for sharing information and making objects interactive or learning objects at a distance provided you have access to the appropriate equipment. So I think we'll see a lot more about this. I'm really excited to see how it evolves. This is my contact information, and I've been involved in the library's 3D printing and virtual reality initiatives. This is the contact information for Dr. Stephanie Drumheller Horton of the University of Tennessee, Knoxville. She originally asked me to give this presentation to help develop some ideas for how models that were previously used for 3D printing for educational purposes could be repurposed and used effectively in a distance environment. So she and some collaborators are looking into that now. This is the end of the presentation. Thank you very much for your time and attention. If you do have questions or you'd like to learn more about any of these topics, please feel free to contact me. I'm always happy to talk and happy to point you to resources. Have a wonderful day and thank you for listening.